Hey guys, this is John. I'm playing TRH Dude in a 5 plus 5 game on chess.com. It's another climbing to rating ladder. Let's play Sicilian. My opponent's rated 1844. Good player. And for Chaldi and King out there, I may just play a Nidorf. I know you've been asking a lot recently. I hope you're watching this video. I'm going to play a Nidorf. Get ready, my friend. All right, a6. And I'll play e6, bishop e7, and maybe look to break with d5. So players at this rating level... Typically pretty pretty tactically astute, although, you know, it is blitz, anything can happen. Um, I can go for a hedgehog formation. I think I'm going to do that because I'm pretty comfortable with that setup. So b6, bishop b7, put the knight on d7. And black's a bit cramped in this setup, uh, certainly visually. However, if you know the plans, you can often break out uh, later in the middle game by virtue of pawn breaks, d5 or b5 being classic ones. Also rearrangement plans. So one common maneuver is to play queen b8 and then bishop d8 to c7, which fits in nicely if you ever get to play d5. This rook typically goes to e8 in this formation. So let's play queen b8 to start. And I'm curious what, what plan my opponent will throw at me here. Yeah, b3, pretty standard stuff so far. Could play rook f e8, but I also like maneuvering the, the bishop. But yeah, let's play rook e8 right away. But don't be surprised if I go for this. So we got the five second increment. Again, for improvement purposes, I do recommend a longer time control than this, but I think this fits in nicely with uh, being able to record a quick video. It's about 8.45 right now. I like to post at 10 o'clock my time. So queen f2. All right, let's play bishop d8 going to c7. And I will say for blitz, you can still play, play a pretty good game at 5-5. Five, five. Having that increment does help. So provided you're using your time, this prevents truly crazy time scrambles, and you can think for a little bit at critical moments, but far better to play like a 15-10, for instance. Okay, now the bishop goes back to d3. Yeah, I don't see the purpose of this move for white because it just blocks his play along the D file. Probably would have been better to uh, maybe start thinking about my my bishop C7 and D5 plan. When I see this move, I'm almost tempted to play D5 right away. There could be a bunch of liquidations, but I think it's better just to have the bishop poised here. So he might play one of these moves because when I play D5, I will be hitting that pawn on H2. So yeah, there he goes. He plays G3. And... Against g3, I kind of like the idea idea of h5, h4, probing that structure a little bit more. Uh, again, I can consider d5, but if there's multiple trades, you do have to watch out for this a6 pawn hanging in the end. I could play king h8, rook g8, and go for g5, g4. That's always an interesting plan, too. So-called Fisher, Fisher plan in this setup. Uh, knight e5 is another move I'm looking at. Knight c5, even. Really kind of spoiled for choice here. You know what? I'm going to go with king h8, rook g8, g5, g4 as a way to try to break his structure. Okay, and he goes back to f1. So he seems a little bit uncertain what to do in this position. So let's see what he does about this. Okay, he puts the bishop on g2. And he's moving, in my opinion, way too fast. Uh, I know it's a closed position. I know it seems like there's mostly going to be maneuvering to be had. But if I were him, I would use some of that excess time that he's already built up. He's above the amount of time that he started with to try to figure out what to do. Because if we get a little bit further along here, it may be too late. And truth be told, in this setup, white should be pushing the queenside pawns more aggressively, playing for a3, b4. Often the knight coming back to b3, trying to prop up a c5 type move. He hasn't done that. Okay, queen d2, so he is attacking the pawn on g5 twice. I saw that move. g4 was kind of my default response, which is really going to weaken this structure for him. Now I kind of wish my queen was on a8, although I can put that there in the future. Uh, I could also reinforce, play h6 if I wanted, but I think just g4 right away looks pretty good. Start leaning on his structure quite a bit. Yeah, let's play this. So looking to weaken f3 and e4. Yeah, and he plays f4, and maybe now queen here. Or knight c5. I think both moves merit consideration. Kind of like queen a8 a little bit more because I create the queen bishop battery. 
I have e5 very well protected, so I'll just be firing away at this pawn. And I can keep knight c5 in reserve, perhaps. But just debating between the two options. Yeah, let's go with queen a8. And on queen c2, then I might play knight c5. If queen d3 to defend the e4 pawn, knight c5 is coming with tempo on the queen. So I'm not sure white can hold this pawn anymore. He may have to start thinking of a way to offload it, e5 or f5, something like that. Plays queen c2. Just checking before I play knight c5 if there's any sort of tactic I'm missing here. Because I think he's going to start lashing out when I play that. Because if he loses the e-pawn for no compensation, it's going to be rapidly downhill for him. So I'm looking at f5 type moves. I think I can just play e5 against that. I'm not really seeing anything. My knight on f6 does become undefended when I play knight c5. So I have to take that into account. But I think it's good. I think everything checks out. Maybe queen b2? Like That would be a really weird move here. But long range trying to somehow get some counterplay against this knight might be possible that would be a, a nice find for white if he if he finds that move i'm not even sure it works maybe i play e5 against that but worth considering because this is the type of position i think you know several moves ago white had to be careful not to drift into where he's played you know not incredibly uh, productive moves, but he hasn't done anything egregiously bad, but he finds himself in a tough position about to lose a pawn. Very easy to drift in positions like this. Okay, f5, so I was thinking about playing e5 against that. I don't want to cash in right away because after a bunch of trades, white will be attacking e6 twice. So yeah, let's play e5. In playing e5, I do give up control of the d5 square. So white may be looking to jump a knight in, but this move comes with tempo, and taking that e4 pawn will be compensation for sure, so for giving up the d5 square. Quick look at the time. I'm doing all right. Got about three minutes left. We're on move 25 now. All right, which way to take? My instincts say take with the c knight, keep a little bit better protection of d5 for the time being. And then if knight d5, yeah, I can take it with my knight. That looks good if there's multiple trades. Here's a counting thing, too. So we got to count attackers and defenders. White has one, two, three defenders of this pawn here, right? I always forget how to make multicolor uh, arrows and circles. but And I have four attackers. One, two, three, four. So I am go to take this. Let's take it this way, like I said. Also, the b6 pawn is protected. My bishop doing a nice job of holding both these pawns. And I have two center pawns to white's none. That's something I talk frequently about in my videos. Always got to value those center pawns a bit more than the wing pawns, uh, especially at the outset of a game. As the game goes along, the wing pawns can become increasingly valuable. But Okay, knight takes e4. Now, do I want to give up my light square bishop or not? I'm kind of leaning towards keeping my light square bishop. I know it's a trade, but um, I feel like I have more potential down this diagonal than white does. I mean, both moves are, look good. But yeah, let's keep it. I feel like this is going to create more problems for him. Like, he constantly has to think, if I just move this knight somewhere, what will happen on this long diagonal? It may ultimately result in a trade. Okay, wow, and he's giving me the light squares. See, this, I think, is going to lead to major fatal problems in a second here, because I might just play bishop h1 after this queen moves and threaten queen g2 mate in a pretty interesting way. And if he has to start running with his king... Not to mention, after the queen moves, I even have the option of just taking on f5. Okay, so let's think for a second here. Two good options on the table. Bishop h1, or bishop takes f5. Bishop h1, threatening that mate. Yeah, white can move his knight, though, I guess. So he can play knight c3, and his queen will guard from a distance. So maybe that isn't all it's cracked up to be. 
Uh, bishop, here's another move I should look at. I don't have a ton of time in this position. Taking one more gander at bishop h1, but knight c3 does seem to defend, despite how precarious that looks. Yeah, I think I'm just going to take another pawn. My queen still has the option of infiltrating. He'll probably play this, although then maybe I can play bishop d3 with queen e4 on the horizon. Plays knight c3. Okay, so he's going to try to pivot into the d5 square. Understandable. Uh, okay, let's get the queen in, I think. Yeah, let's go queen here. And if knight d5, maybe now I just play bishop e4 and line up the queen bishop battery. Okay, queen there. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe I'm going to have to retreat. Bishop e6. Bishop e6, rook f1. Yeah, I guess I may have to retreat, but it looks fine. Looks all right. Let's go queen back to b7, I think. On bishop g5, I think I'll play rook here. Or f5. Well, f5 allows bishop f6, so probably rook g6 is best. Yeah, definitely getting an f5 soon seems nice. If he plays rook f6, I think again rook here. Okay, yeah, f5 just seems pretty wise at this juncture. Or rook g6. Nah, let's go f5. Connect stuff together here. If the knight ever jumps into d5, I can take it. Do have to watch this pawn, though, a little bit? Bishop g5, okay. Let's play the rook up, just guard against bishop f6. And now I'm definitely thinking about playing b5 if I get the chance, and maybe bishop b6 is lurking. Knight d5, hmm. Taking looks like the default thing to do here. Don't have a ton of time at this moment. Could also play for b5, like I said. Bishop d8 even, too, looks good. Let's play bishop d8. But yeah, gotta move a little bit faster now, for sure. Taking, the only thing I didn't like about it was white c file pressure and my bishop kind of blocking. I feel like I need to move the bishop or play b5 after that, so i just like to trade first, clarify the situation, still retain the option of taking. He might trade and then play the knight back to e3 and try to pressure my e-pawn. I think I have queen e4 in that case, perhaps, but we'll see. Or maybe queen c8. Queen c8 also looks pretty good. Queen c8, queen c5 might be decent. So I'm ahead two pawns here, but he has managed to get his knight into a good square. I still would like to trade that, but I got to time it right. Might want to play b5. I think some undermining moves are still in order here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I really like the idea of b5. Yeah, let's go try to knock out one of the defenses here. I'm not sure what rook c3 really does. Don't know why that move appealed to him. Okay, but now that just loses this. Granted, he can trade and then take this pawn, but I think I should be able to deal with that pretty handily. Um, maybe bishop f3. Or rook a7. Or rook g7 first. Let's play bishop f3. Kind of solidify our bishop. I'm looking to go d5, d4. Just start running. 
And once he pushes this pawn, which I assume he'll do, uh, maybe just d4 after that. Yeah, d4, have my bishop also guard this. If he plays rook c2, I can always play rook g8 if I need to. Or bishop back to a8. Also, d3 just looks strong. Yeah, I think d3 is easiest. And if rook c8, I can play rook g8. The bishop long-range defense of this square. Always keeping an eye. Just take. Now he's going to have to play rook d2. And e3 uh, here, and then just go after his... Or bishop e2. Bishop e2 looks pretty clean. Bishop e2, and then bring the rook over and win the pawn. Just try to keep some of my pawns on um, dark squares. Like, I'd like to play f4, I think, here. Yeah, f4. Keep his king out of e3. Rook's very locked up. So go after this pawn now. Take this. And I'm going to start pushing these pawns because he's kind of locked down now. So notice how if he plays b5, he runs into issues, and I'm going to go for g3 next. He does get connected pawns, but they're going to be very tough for him to stop. Okay, here... I can play this and then go take this guy. Could even get fancy and do this. I have a bit of time now so I can think. Rook here's another move. Maybe that's just easiest. Mm, I don't know though. I'm going to go with this one, actually. Take. Got to make sure to keep these pawns, though. So if rook d5, I can go here. Yeah, I think I'm just going to put this here and play g2. Could also give a check and play g2. That looks pretty straightforward. Let's do that one. Yeah, he can't stop g1. He has, he has a check here, but king comes up and then defending the seventh rank. Yeah, I think I converted that a little shakily. I think when I played, what was it, bishop takes f5, and I don't, I think queen f3 was probably the culprit. Bringing the queen in was an unproductive move. That was a bit optimistic. I thought it would misplace his pieces by attacking the bishop, and he does resign. So I'm thanks for the game. Yeah, queen f3 was the one move, if I could have it back, I would, I would take that one back, because... Being up two pawns here, I think if I just play a little bit more uh, in a consolidating manner, I should win without a problem. But this actually got me a little bit wrong-footed. Basically gave him rook f1 with tempo for free. So, um, But I think this was a good game for this structure. So again, shout out to Chaldean King for the Nidorf. I know it wasn't exactly like a mainline Nidorf position. It transposed into a Hedgehog. I actually did a video on the plans and ideas in this formation. I'll link it to you guys in, uh, in the comments or the description. But yeah, there's a number of different plans available to black here, and I showcased a couple of them. So this so-called Samish maneuver, playing the bishop to d8 and then to c7. And notice the rook placement. This is just optimal if you're going to play d5 at some point in the future in open lines. You want the rooks bearing down on these files. 
Also leaves that d8 square open. I pursued this uh, Fisher plan. King h8, rook g8, g5, g4. Fisher played this actually from the white side in a kind of reversed hedgehog formation against Ulf Anderson at the Saigon Olympiad in like 1970, I think. That's where it gets its name. And this can really serve well to weaken a structure here with the pawn on f3. So playing g5, g4, looking to weaken that structure. He could have played h3, and I might have gone ahead and played h5, still trying to do this. But yeah, if you're white, you really got to avoid drifting. So like once he gets here, he needs a plan at this point. He's played all logical moves, but he can't just continue shuttling his pieces around and waiting. So, and I described this in the Hedgehog video, but in my opinion, a3 followed by b4 and knight b3 is one of the more dangerous plans for white. Because after we played a few more moves and I got all of those productive moves in, attacking his structure, he had trouble defending e4. In the analysis, I will look at queen b2. I'm kind of curious about that one. So let's go and click over to the analysis board. Um, I'm going to largely skip the opening. Again, if you're interested in the opening and kind of the nuances of it, go check out my hedgehog video. But yeah, let's take this position like right around here. So I think he should play a3. And a plan like this is usually pretty good. You see positions like this. White has a better chance of being able to do something on the queen side. Playing in the center and on the queen side is usually what white should be going for in these positions. Sometimes even a4, a5 later. Um, but yeah, black can look to, look to line up d5 in the future. That's the, the key pawn break, opening the queen bishop battery. Because just got to avoid these kind of listless moves. Queen f2, and especially bishop d3. I think bishop d3 only hurt white. Got in the way of his rook. I'm actually kind of curious what the engine says round about here for me. Yeah, and the engine notoriously dislikes these positions for black. It still gives an advantage for white. Uh, the engine, I think, is pretty heavily influenced by the amount of space white has in these formations. But I can tell you, having played the white and black sides of the hedgehog, um, they're never clear to me over the board. I mean, I think both sides have their trumps. So, but yeah, bishop d3, especially since white went back to f1 very soon thereafter, I don't see the purpose of it. Okay, yeah, I thought about knight e5 or knight c5 here, but king g8 followed by rook g8 seemed interesting, so I pursued that plan. Yeah, again, very healthy advantage for white according to the computer, plus 1.29, but um, I don't think a human player, especially a strong player, will look at this and agree with that assessment. It says white should play g4 here for the record. Kind of an unusual move. Maybe put a stop to black playing uh, g5, g4. So bishop g2, g5. Yeah, queen d2 did hit the pawn. But given that I want to play g4 anyways, this in a sense only helped me because at least when the queen's on f2, maybe there's some pressure against f7, although I am still pretty primed to play this. I think if I were white, I'd be mostly more looking at h3. The engine wants to play knight c2 or knight de2. Interesting. Queen d2, g4. Yeah, f4. Okay, interestingly, that the computer says this is still fine. I wonder if it's because white has that queen b2 resource coming up. Because I thought this was all pretty natural. Yeah, queen b2 right here. Interesting. Also says white can play b4, sack this pawn and then play b5, and it still thinks white's doing all right. Maybe it thinks that black, because I've played g5, g4, and weakened my king along this diagonal, that even though I'm up a pawn here, uh, the uh, the chickens may be coming home to roost at some point. <laughs> take, take, knight e4. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I could see why there's some issues here on this diagonal with my undefended knight. Interesting assessment by the engine there. Yeah, queen b2, though, was the move I was kind of concerned about. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do against that. Maybe e5? So, interestingly, even though white has played outwardly, like, unimpressive, uh, sort of, I don't know, 
moves that don't seem to contribute to an overall plan. White's still doing okay, according to the computer, but they need a lot of precision at this point. Yeah, queen b2. Hmm. And it says I should go back with the knight to d7 after that and just guard the f6 knight. But he played f5, and then I went ahead and played e5, which looks correct. Because again, if I take everything off here and we have just mass trades, White can take on e6 at the end, and I didn't want to allow that. So, yeah, e5. Interesting that knight d5 is a, select, a, su a suggestion here from the computer. Knight d5 can sometimes be played. But take. E takes, and basically I can try to win this piece and defend f6. Yeah, this looks good for black if this were to happen. So I don't know that white wants to do that. Knight de2. Okay, and now the advantage is swinging in my direction. But even here, like, there's some variation the engine's giving where white can stay afloat. Knight d5, take, c takes, and it thinks white's doing all right. White has compensation. Mm hmm. And here, the engine says I might want to take with the bishop. And yeah, given the way the game went... I don't know if I fully agree. Because White just surrendered his bishop on the next move. Which I was very happy to see. I mean, to me, this seemed like a super-duper risky decision. Just giving me the entire uh, light square diagonal. So White should probably keep his bishop. But yeah, I can see why if White does keep his bishop, why bishop takes e4 directly may just be a better move here. Just look at a trade. You know, stuff like this. Knight takes or queen takes here. Play the position up a pawn. If, White Knight's, if White's knight ever comes here, just trade it before it establishes itself on d5. Okay. And here I was mentioning a few different moves. Like, I was at first very excited about bishop h1, because it looks like such an aesthetically pleasing move, threatening queen g2 mate. But knight c3 does seem to defend, and... Okay, I've got a bishop on h1, but what else am I doing here? <laughs> I think taking the pawn on f5 is a pretty human decision. Engine also says bishop f3 or maybe b5. Yeah, bishop bishop f3 crossed my mind, but hard to resist taking the pawn. And here it wants me to put the bishop right back on e4. So probably this knight c3 to d5 maneuver is the only real thing that's giving white compensation here. Interestingly, queen f3, the move that I was criticizing, is actually the top move according to the engine. Queen d2... Now what? Hmm. Yeah, bishop e4 is another option. If I want to try to force white to trade the knight for the bishop, that might be the thing to do. So even though I was kind of louding my light square play here, given that white is going to get a pretty nice knight on d5, I actually wouldn't mind a trade of the, the bishop for the knight. So yeah, maybe bishop e4 in hindsight. Like, I think I'd rather play this position than the one I got in the game where white got their knight to d5 and the rook over to f1 and some activity. And let's just quickly see if at any point white had anything here. This is still pretty darn positive evaluation for black. Yeah, now it's over plus two. Bishop d8 looks good. Thing was, I was running a little bit low on time at this point. Didn't like rook c3. You know, I think white's got to play a bit more purposefully than that. You know, I would have thought something like knight e3. At least try to attack f5, put a little pressure there. Make me work a little bit more. But yeah, rook c3, I got to play an undermining move, and this kind of struck me as a blunder because I think white played it pretty fast. Or perhaps he knew he was in a tough spot down two pawns and just said, all right, might as well try to get this pawn mass on the uh, queen side and see what happens. If I take with a bishop, by the way, then this gives white the option of this, and I can't take because I lose d5. So uh, that's why I thought queen takes was all right, even though white does get this seemingly dangerous a pawn. As soon as I coordinate my pieces here, I'm up so much material with the bishop and the two center pawns. Yes, I'm facing these, but these pawns are pretty fast as well. And I think my technique was all right here. Again, let's just briefly check. I know it looks scary, but again, we got the bishop guarding a8 from a distance. Bishops are long-range pieces. We like it. Maybe I overcomplicated things here, but it always seemed to be winning. Yeah, f4. 
So I was just trying to avoid a scenario. I know e4 looks very tempting and also probably a winning move, but I just didn't like white's king coming up and blockading this entire construction. You know, it crossed my mind that maybe, maybe we get some position like this and white can play rook b2 and try to advance his pawns when I have like a relatively useless bishop. So, you know, if you're already pretty strong on one color complex, like in this case, the light squares, I don't think it, it makes sense for me to... Um, put everything on a light square. I can try to keep some of my pawns on dark squares. So f4, try to keep the king out of e3. Yeah. And I wouldn't let this a pawn survive so long if not for the fact that these pawns were further back and couldn't help it. And white's rook was pretty pretty useless too, trying to stop this pawn, so. Yep, and then I connected my pawns over here. Again, I know it looks like momentarily kind of scary. We're facing two connected pawns, but... I think everything's under control. Yeah, and I had my last like long think. Fortunately, I built up a little bit of time where I was able to think at this point. So D2, I think, is a decent human way to try to win this. I figured I could always play my bishop to C6 check and play G2. And even if white won the H-pawn, that would ensure me victory. And that does seem to be the case. Yeah, check and push G2. Okay, interesting hedgehog game. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, again, I think if you're white in these formations, don't wait a while to choose a plan and don't shuttle your pieces back and forth. Back and forth, Your chances lie on the queen side. So you should be trying to play a3, b4, knight b3, possibly a4, a5 eventually. That sort of plan. Uh, and again, see my hedgehog video if you're, if you're curious about how to implement that. You can even try a plan to try to stop black from playing bishop d8 to c7, which I mentioned in that hedgehog video, which involves attacking the pawn on d6, like withdrawing this knight to b3 really quickly. I think those are all better options. All right, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll be back again soon with another video.